today's talk, our speaker is uh, Professor Jonathan Smith. So Professor Smith is an associate professor of Chinese and director of the Chinese studies program at the Christopher Newport University. So his academic focus is early Chinese language and writing. Um, his newest publications tend to the historical phonology of the Southeastern South Ming languages. So today uh, he will talk about the new digital resources for the study of historical and comparative Ming. And I think this is part of his recent project, right? So Professor Smith, please. Yeah, thank you for the, for the very nice introduction. Thank you for the invitation as well. It's a tremendous honor. I um, hope I can say some things that are of interest. I mean, I had thought for a while about trying to do a more technical problem, but maybe it's actually interesting to think about um, just the resources that are available. Uh, largely, it's not stuff that I've, well, it's, it's stuff that I've gotten from various sources. It's not original with me, but uh, the goal is to uh, sort of uh, trove around for material and make it accessible to a broader audience. So uh, you guys can help me out, think about uh, the progress that I've made and uh, how, how it should best be sort of utilized, leveraged and shared. Um, I'm not I'm not an authority on uh, mean dialectology or on historical phonology, really. I've come to this subject area a bit randomly. Originally, I was working mostly with early writing. Um, but uh, more recently, I've gotten interested in uh, historical phonology. Uh, trying to collect and organize data is something I've been spending a lot of time with, but off and on. Um, I start on a project and uh, sort of uh, see how productive it is for me uh, and then often move on to something else. And then as far as my work inside uh, historical mean, uh, I suppose it's sort of chaos agent or disruptive, sort of um, uh, seeing some things that maybe don't make sense and pointing them out. Whether in the long term there's going to be a productive enterprise, I'm not very sure. But uh, the idea is to um, uh, points as a problem and to, to try to try to spur us forward a little bit. When we talk about a proto mean or common mean, uh, to be real, we haven't made maybe a, a whole ton of progress since Norman's work in the 70s. That's not to say there's not a lot more data, a, a lot more ideas. There, there, there are a lot more ideas, but uh, ultimately the structure of proto mean is what it was in 1973. Um, so is there a way through or a way forward uh, uh, to, 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 to more progress in this area? Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll show you guys just some material that I've collected. Uh, we can sort of discuss together. Um, this is some mean points. Uh, we'll see the specifics momentarily, but um, the points that are relevant that are relevant to, for example, Akatani, Professor Akatani's book from 2008 that talks about northern mean. The points that are relevant to his book about very similar parallel book about Ningda part of eastern mean, and then the southern mean points that are the emphasis in uh, Guo Bichu's book about recent 2018 book also about southern mean. Of course, there's a lot more data out there, but the stuff that I have prepared initially in my presentation is relevant to these points. Um, so generally, if we zoom out, this is sort of the spread of mean as part of the spread of Semitic languages and cultures to the south over the course of 2000 years or more. Um, the nature of this process is still a bit blurry. It's not entirely clear. Um, often the assumption or the natural assumption, the, the more traditional normal assumption is that uh, that there's sort of a Chinese colonization, to use a problematic term of this area, and that uh, indigenous people uh, languages are largely acculturated, displaced or acculturated. Maybe that's not, um, uh, maybe the picture is in fact richer than that. Um, at that kind of time depth, it's possible that the process is more bidirectional, that there are relatively uh, complex uh, southern cultures that uh, are, are, are present in this area uh, when when the Chinese languages sort of expand south and that we have a kind of a long-term cultural mixture bilingualism in this area. Um, so 
in my opinion, we have to be a bit cautious approaching uh, mean data. I suppose it's, it should be unproblematic to say that mean is senitic, but uh, when we look at the colloquial layers, there's a lot of material there which is not necessarily senitic in origin. Um, so looking at any individual item, it's good to, in my opinion, it's good to sort of remain um, agnostic initially. Uh, rather than instantly connect it to some apparent cognate in Middle Chinese or in other Chinese languages. Uh, some very, uh, some words that will appear uh, at first blush to be clear cognates turn out not to be on closer examination. So in some, uh, to some degree, it's good to sort of treat mean data uh, to, uh, as its own thing, and then maybe think at some later stage about what's the nature of the relationship to other Chinese or to other languages of sort of uh, Southeast Asia, Southern, old Southern China, Southeast Asia. Um, I guess I'll, I'll show you quickly what Norman's uh, proto mean looks like, but we do not have to get into detail about this. Maybe everyone is familiar. Uh, yeah, so I, I don't have a sense for uh, to what degree everyone is a more expert than I am in these areas. It's possible everyone uh, is hugely familiar with this system, but this is actually not exactly like the papers Norma published in the early 70s. This is a manuscript. Actually, uh, Professor South Coblin gave me this manuscript from 1974. It's very similar, but it's not identical in all respects to the protamine of Norman's 1973-1974 papers. Uh, one of the projects that I was trying to work on was digitizing this manuscript. It's all typewritten pages. Uh, it's slightly more extensive in terms of the cognate sets when you compare it to some of the published work. So it would be very nice to, um, I was thinking I could do it very fast, digitize it and make it more accessible. But these projects turn out to take a lot longer than you anticipate that they will. So at some point, I'll uh, hopefully be able to create a more accessible digital version of this particular manuscript, which was never published. At any rate, uh, you guys, I'm sure everyone knows there's 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 weird typological features of this uh, proto mean system. For example, the voiced aspirates. We're used to these Chinese systems where um, devoicing and registered genesis appears to happen in a more or less principled way, where you have early uh, voiced onsets that are devoiced into aspirates, not aspirates, but in a principled way where we can talk about a complementary distribution, like the Mandarin situation is uh, aspirates in the old level tongue versus non-aspirates elsewhere. But the mean situation is different where we have uh, these modern aspirates across the tones. So at sort of the usual generalization about mean is that uh, there are non-aspirates, but most of these uh, old voiced onsets are gonna be non-aspirates across the tones. But there is this relatively small set of aspirates across tones, which compelled Norman in 1973 to uh, reconstruct so-called voiced aspirates. Uh, for our purposes, this is just sort of a placeholding convenience. Uh, people find this to be typologically implausible, but it doesn't particularly matter. At any rate, it seems to be a valid comparative category. Um, of course, later on, Norm is going to uh, ch change his approach. The, the reasons for, for uh, why he ultimately switched to a more or a common mean type framework maybe aren't essential to consider. But uh, this is the initial idea. And my sense from people who work closely on comparative mean now is that this is the preference uh, when we compare it to Norman's later adjustments. Common mean system is to retain the special categories, uh, most importantly probably being the voiced aspects because this class sort of unites mean as diagnostic in mean. We can uh, create cognate sets of modern voices aspirates across all the lower level tones. Um, and then, uh, of course, softened onsets. Um, the details here are, 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 are interesting, but maybe, maybe less important for our purposes. Uh, modern Northern mean languages still have voiced onsets uh, that often seem to correspond to simply regular voiceless 
onsets in coastal mean. So there seems to have been some other kind of onset. Exactly what it was, Norman was a, a bit uh, noncommittal, ambiguous about. But this is how he represented these special sounds that are going to account for sort of anomalous voicing in modern northern mean languages is the sort of uh, hyphen. He says on several different occasions that uh, probably this was some kind of uh, de segmental depletion at the left-hand side, so there was some kind of complex onset, but he prefers not to speculate about what these particular segments were. Actually, he says the same thing about voiceless aspirates, but prefers to hew close to the modern values in turn, when he goes to sort of uh, choose a particular representation for the proto-mean system. Actually, part of what common mean later does is hew even closer to the modern value by abandoning, uh, yeah, by uh, just just going back to simply voiced, voiceless aspirated and voiceless sounds and forgetting about uh, register genesis entirely. But uh, uh, probably the best reference point if we're thinking about what proto mean common mean was like is this earlier protamine system with the voiced aspirates with the so-called softened onsets that are going to be uh, both voiced and voiceless and among other things which are of some uh, interest but these are the main sort of long-lasting persistent controversies uh, in a uh, common mean. Sorry, I'm trying to keep a little bit of track of my time. I don't want to uh, not have a chance to uh, show you guys the sort of historical material. This this is not that important, but um, this is just illustrative of one kind of problem where we have these, for example, on the left hand side in coastal mean, we have these we have these doublets where we have a, a, a non-aspirated and aspirated member. And there's a temptation to see them as a, as a, 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 a protomy phenomenon or a very early mean phenomenon. But it's not clear exactly to what extent that's the case. Uh, when we talk about these coastal mean examples, there aren't good in the mean parallels cognates for the aspirated cases. So probably if we look on the far right hand side, on occasion, a Norman can be found to speculate that this thing goes to some kind of protomy form, which would have to be a voiced aspirate. But probably uh, there's no need to re regard these items as going back to protomy. However, the middle case, the inland mean case, is uh, more controversial, or it's harder to tell whether or not these reconstructions to the protomy softened and plain values are valid or not. Uh, inside of Northern Mean, we also get this kind of doubleting uh, where we have what looks like, uh, a, in this case, what looks like a verb and what looks like just a post position. Um, is it relatively recent inside Northern Mean or is it something that's historically deeper? I just mentioned this uh, to give one little illustration of uh, some of the problems that you run into when you're trying to figure out uh, to what extent, how big these categories are. So in some of my papers, my, my, uh, my inclination is to consider these categories to be smaller than others. So I think, for example, the protomy soften category is, exists but is much smaller than is presented even in Doran's papers of the 70s. And then this uh, voiced aspirated category also uh, is, seems to be comparatively valid, but there are many trick items that up here, if you just look at coastal mean to belong to this category, but perhaps deeply uh, are, aren't going to be present as a proto mean. Instead, are some more recent phenomena inside of coastal mean languages. Anyway, we get some sense for these uh, complexities when we go and try to figure out uh, which uh, items, which which are uh, uh, which of these cognate sets or apparent cognate sets are really traceable to proto mean level. Uh, that's all I put inside this presentation. Instead, we can just, uh, I'll, I'll share with you some material that I have. 
where the correct answers to these questions aren't so important. Instead, it's just a matter of thinking about the data that's available and maybe being able to leverage it in new ways. It seems that, I mean, compared to 50 years ago when Norman is working, first working on protamine, I mean, there's dozens of times more data available than there was then, if not more. So it should be possible to discover new things or at least to render uh, uh, Norman's uh, hypotheses more precise in many ways. But it's not necessarily easy to access, manipulate, leverage the data in the ways that we want to. Actually, I'm by no means uh, super skilled at doing stuff like this. I'm sure there are many people out there, perhaps in the audience, who will instantly be able to make more of this material than I am able to. Um, but hopefully in the very near future, everyone will have access and you can make of this material what you will. Um, and, you know, for example, apply computation, computational sorts of methods to it. Um, I'll show you Professor Akatani's book from 2008. He has many similar works. The amount of work he's done in sort of uh, documenting mean and other modern Chinese languages is mind boggling completely staggering. I mean, even if we just look at sort of, this is the sources for his, for the, the this section is his, you know, lexicon, northern mean lexicon, so sort of comparing key items across various northern mean languages and uh, in some cases comparisons that are more distant. I mean, uh, it, it seems as if he's produced as much dialogue, sort of mean dialect material as anyone else or as much as everyone else combined it sometimes feels. At any rate, there is a ton to be learned from books like this. This is about Northern mean in particular and focuses on three particular uh, points. They are here. And wait, I want to zoom in, but I have to move my windows around. So in northern Fujian province, these are the these are the points that he's focused on in this particular book. Shubei, uh, Shubei in Google, Shubei in Norman's books, uh, uh, sometimes Romanized differently in other works. Gentia, uh, all the villages in northern Fujian, uh, northern Fujian province. So this one, Diko. Um, these three points are the focus of this particular book that we're looking at right now. So one kind of data. To move, let me move a little more quickly. One kind of data is this, the sort of uh, a homophone character collection, massive amount of material collected in this form and very familiar to Chinese dialectologists. Uh, but from a sort of, if you want to make use of and, uh, uh, and do sort of automated comparison across this kind of data, you want to present it in a different form. Um, so I'll show you. In general, I'll try to keep these original sources on the left-hand side, and I'll show you on the right, like what I've what what I've uh, been able to digitize. So this is, of course, each individual dialect point in this book, Akatani's book, two thousand eight, about uh, northern mean languages, will have an equivalent Tongyin Zhui, a sort of collection of homophone where the individual syllables slash characters are organized into homophone groups where rhyme is the big level organization and then all the onsets are uh, presented beneath and then inside of each onset category you have uh, you have it broken but broken down by tone and so on and so for example on my left my right hand side over here so this is more or less the Tony Yin Zuhui from this 2008 book. Generated, initially I tried to generate it from this uh, copy of the book that I made. Subsequently, uh, Professor Akhtani sent me clearer digital files, which are still in that basic same format, but um, are easier to manipulate. So for example, this is the same material that's in Let's try to show these in parallel if I can. The same material that's here on the left, but presented in sort of spreadsheet type form where the syllables are all here. It's broken down. I split it into onset final tone is here. And then the characters. Um, 
And then now we have a clear sense of exactly how much material is here, which is a ton. So we're talking about sort of a near on 4,000 individual uh, syllable slash morpheme slash characters inside of this particular collection. This is this particular file is just Shubei, and then the other two are also here. Um, I, I guess one thing that I've been thinking about as I do this is what sort of uh, and you guys, of course, will have opinions about what's more or less useful. What kind of what kind of uh, a final product is most useful? Uh, initially, I wanted to do sort of more immediately, and for example, combine all of these tones into one single file and start aligning cognates or aligning similar characters. You can, of course, do that relatively easily when the data is in this form on the right hand side. Um, however, that begins to get further from the original shape of the data. Uh, and maybe I thought it's better to leave it in forms that uh, resemble the original document. So this particular Excel file is sort of uh, uh, a digital version of certain pieces of Akitani's book from 2008. And the three different dialect points are strictly separated rather than being combined into a single file. So individual people, if you're, you know, you get access to this file, you start using the file, you can proceed according uh, to your own preferences and how to organize or how to think about uh, this material. Um, I guess a, a question is, what's the status of some of these items? So it's 4,000 somethings, but uh, it's not necessarily obvious that these are, uh, for example, words of the colloquial dialect uh, of this region. Um, so one of the things, sort of all pseudo-philosophical questions you have to think about in dealing with this material is what am I going to uh, take and discard? Uh, what is going to be valuable in terms of doing comparison and con reconstructing protoforms? And what is potentially going to be less valuable? Um, I, I don't know the answer to the question. I mean, I certainly know I've run into problems where such and such a form uh, turned out to uh, yeah, not be as meaningful as I expected it to be. Um, but you really have to have a very close understanding of this particular, or one of these particular varieties in order to know for sure, is such and such uh, a word proper of this particular variety of uh, Northern mean, or is it part of a word? Is it uh, at least a morpheme that exists inside of co certain colloquial vocabulary items? Or is it a none of the above? Uh, without a sort of a, some expert guidance from Professor Akitani or other, it's going to be very hard to make these kinds of distinctions. So for example, one way you could sort I, I had just toyed with this idea, but you could sort, for example, by, you could find all the items that don't have written characters associated with them. These are necessarily um, stuff from a, a, a local colloquial. And you can easily sort them on that particular parameter if you're using this Excel file. Uh, and then suddenly you have a collection of m potentially more interesting items that you can use to go and compare to other northern mean or to other mean. Um, you can also sort on what items are provided with particular special glosses and examples. And there's, so there's obviously a lot of overlap between the words that don't have a, an associated written character and the words which require some additional explanation or gloss or context. So I started marking these items that, uh, you know, have no character or are glossed in some particular way. And it seems to me that uh, if you want to do sort of more detailed comparison across these three northern mean varieties or other northern mean or potentially more broadly across them, but these are going to be items that are going to be of most value of most use. Uh, however, yeah, for now this material is just here and then uh, precisely how to use and leverage it is a matter for uh, us to discuss or for individual people to uh, decide for themselves. But at any rate, this is here as a, a parallel version of certain, of this particular aspect, this particular feature of 
this book and other of Professor Akitani's books. Um, this, this section, these Tony Zui are attractive because there's so much material here. However, it's not always, it's not necessarily easy to pick through. Um, so another valuable section is real lexicons. This is sort of always uh, an issue in Chinese dialectology is, are we gonna have lists of sort of uh, character readings where we're not totally clear about the status of individual items, or are we gonna collect lexicons proper where we have real words of, uh, of colloquial languages? So this particular piece collects, um, you know, it's it's a lexicon. The downside is it's not, of course, uh, everything is relative. This is, uh, of course, in itself a, a sort of mind-boggling project. However, if you're talking about sheer quantity, it's just sort of 600 atoma as opposed to sort of what seems to be 4,000 different items that we could sort of use automated procedures to compare across mean languages. Uh, uh, and potentially sort of um, see more, uh, see more deeply. Here we have a smaller set of more substantive, shall we say, items. Uh, but the first thing that we really want, that I really wanted to do, was translate the 600 item lexicon into English. So I'll show you where I did that. Um, We're still doing this in a principal way, kind of. Let's see. So this particular list has 600 items, and he's used it in multiple words. Initially, he was working with a somewhat smaller list. Some earlier books are like 480 item lexicon list. Does this my open or no? Uh, yeah, maybe. Let me close this. You can see clearly. This is the 600 item list in English. Um, I'm sure everyone will instantly you know, see things that I uh, made mistakes with. Uh, but uh, this is an attempt at translating the 600 item list. So people who don't necessarily work with Chinese languages can have access to this material. Um, in traditional characters, simple like characters are hidden here, but um, both are there. And then trying to have a gloss. There are different ways to approach doing this kind of translation. So now, of course, there are uh, there are, um, you know, translation tools that can do this stuff very fast. Uh, I've tried it that way with, for example, ChatGPT and stuff. You can translate that way, and it uh, 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 seems to save a lot of time. You, you you feel as if you're doing less typing that way. However, unavoidably, you still have to rewrite, check and rewrite every single item. There's probably not one single item, or maybe there's one. You know, there's a few items where sun is correct or whatever, but in general, you're still going through everything and confirming that it's accurate. Um, so ultimately, do automated translation tools save time? I, I think they do, especially when we get to bigger files. So if you're dealing with a dictionary type of file where you have tens of thousands of entries, then probably a procedure like that will ultimately save time. However, you will inevitably be introducing errors and you'll have to look at every single entry and confirm that it is actually correct. I'm sure I haven't done a perfect job with this, but you get an idea uh, of what this looks like after it's translated. Um, yeah, so this is the initial step is make this lexicon English, done. And then uh, put it into the Northern mean lexicons, also into, we'll see in a second. The same applies to, the same applies to other books, but this is the digital equivalent. The Excel file equivalent of what we're looking at. So left and right are, I hope they are, I mean, perfect is probably uh, an exaggeration, but tries to match this uh, material on the left-hand side as close as possible. So again, it has, uh, this is of course the, 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 the Mandarin words equivalents. 
and then the three points, northern mean points, the uh, in Romanized. So for, for sort of phonetic detail, details about tonal systems, you have to go back to the book. But at least the material that's presented here in the context of the 600 item lexicon is all here. And then I kept all this material represented in, so this is the dialect forms represented in Chinese characters. However, it's um, there are special things about it. It's not always clear. It's far from always clear what character is most appropriate to represent some particular syllable. Often it doesn't really matter. So there are lots of cases where he's used homophone characters and has marked them in various ways or has uh, uh, just simply left boxes to indicate that no uh, homophone character or sort of etymolo etymologically appropriate character exists. So this is here for our reference. However, maybe it's uh, uh, in some ways uh, it's safer and clearer to just focus on the, the Romanized forms. Anyway, you get the idea, I think, of what this looks like. It's not completely done. I want to extract the notes. So there are also little notes associated with various of these items. Here they're in red text. So it's not going to take a minute, but I need to re-separate these columns again so that the notes are retained. Perhaps the notes are even translated. And you have a file that captures all the information in this 600 item lexicon and um, it, it adds English. Uh, that was the idea. So it, it's, I mean, my sense or my aim and my sense is that this is fine if you no, don't read Chinese at all. Um, you can look at the English definitions. Uh, hopefully they're largely accurate. You can look at Romanized forms of Northern mean and learn a lot about these Northern mean languages without having access to the original book. This was the idea. Um, uh, of course, it, it, it goes without saying that the three columns are not necessarily going to be cognates instead that they are uh, you know the local ways to say these various things whether or not they're cognate is a matter of examining correspondences um, but at any rate the idea was to uh, capture uh, this material in a way that's more accessible um, so I guess what I want to do is share this back with Professor Akatani uh, and then I'm sure he'll be totally fine with sharing it more widely for people who are interested in, in looking at it, using it, or potentially correcting it. Hopefully there are not too many errors. But um, that's the idea, is to, in the near term, make this accessible to people who are interested in looking at it who might not necessarily uh, be reading the original work. Uh, let's speed on. Uh, close. This is we don't we don't need to really look at that. This is this is a um, more recent book, 2018, on a subset of Eastern Mean languages that's structured in an extremely similar way. So I did the exact same thing with this material. Um, I'll just show you the. Where did I put it here? Yeah, I did. So, for example, this is the same 600 item lexicon, but in the Ningda languages, the three Ningda points instead of the northern main points. Same idea. Um, again, it's tempting to just combine all this material. You want to kind of have all the words together in one spot, but for now, I prefer to. And maintain these sort of discrete files that reflect particular published sources as precisely as possible. The English list is the same and it's just pasted in here. Um, the Mandarin and English lists are going to be the same, the same 600 lexical items. And then uh, the local ways of saying these various things. Um, we can see in many cases there's more than one possibility. And so all these are listed here and I hope are aligned correctly and accurately reflect the original work. Again, there are notes that need to be extracted that will be of 
variable value and meaning, I guess, if you're working only in English, but nonetheless, we could extract them and translate them and create a database that uh, reflects the original as completely as possible. That's the idea. Um, okay. So the southern main points, this is Gobi's Professor Guac's book about southern main. So for example, there's a very similar section of this book. Let me see if I can find it easily. Uh, for example, if you're just thinking about data, then you want this data. Of course, you want to read and uh, uh, understand more deeply uh, a lot of the particulars, but this would be nice to have in a digital form. Perhaps Professor Glock has it in an equivalent form, uh, but I, I put it into an equivalent form and then I'll check back with him about whether this is something that is redundant with the material he has or can be shared more widely or what, but the same idea. He has English here. so. And in general, these are words. I mean, he's working on, this is uh, like a lexicon. So there are two syllable, a few two syllable items in here. Um, there are also Chinese character renditions, which are, you always want to sort of uh, uh, take with a grain of salt. However, the, the final product is comparable to the Northern Main product and the Ningda product that we were just looking at, where you have an English gloss, you have Romanized forms, you have a uh, character representation. And then he's given the proto Southern Main reconstructions, his new work from, you know, just recently, 2018. Um, so again, using all these resources together, um, yeah, my, my sense is there's um, more to be, for example, one, one thing that you would want is, ideally we have a bigger group of items that are, seem to be shared across me, or at least at uh, some minimum number of points seem to be shared. Combining all the mirror, it seems like there'll be more than Norman was working with. So potentially enough to um, enrich some of his ideas or um, yeah, uh, maybe for example, in the case of voiced aspirates to study particular words in a more detailed way uh, and reach more, perhaps more substantive or more uh, uh, thorough conclusions about the forms of some of these words at early periods. Uh, yeah, I don't want to go much beyond an hour, so let me just move forward to other material. To me, this is the thing that most needs to be digitized and studied, but it is so hard. This is Carstairs Douglas's Amoy Dictionary. Um, it's possible that it's become hard. I think it's become harder to even grab digital files like this, even though they've been out of copyright. This is from 1873. Um, I grabbed a couple different versions of this, and they are not all the same. Some are missing pages, so I've sort of been careful to combine pieces of different ones and come up with a version which I think is fully representative of the original. Later, a, a supplement was also added at a later date by a separate author, um, which is included in this particular version. At any rate, um, a massive uh, piece of work. A in terms of the nature, um, yeah, so one thing that comes up in the context of, or yeah, in association with this particular dictionary is, well, this such and such a word doesn't exist in or doesn't seem to exist in modern Southern Mean languages. So uh, can we be sure that such and such was accurate? Uh, how, uh, how confident can we be that stuff in this book represents uh, 
faithfully represents the language languages of the time. It's hard to say, but I mean, he does say in the introduction that, you know, there were many points at which he was told that something was in fact not valid, removed it from the book, but subsequently was told by some other informant that no, that, that is perfectly valid and please re-add it to your collection. And then, you know, he sort of went through multiple iterations of this book, adding, removing, adding, removing, such that uh, we can have some degree of confidence that um, the items here reflect the language of the time. And actually, as I, maybe you guys are familiar with this book, this is does not only reflect, he was working primarily in Amoy, in Siamat, in the southern Fujian province, uh, but it reflects not only that variety, but also other ver nearby varieties. Um, most prominently uh, is in the title of the book. We find the title of the book. Reflects Chenzhou and Zhangzhou forms. And it's not a small amount when you start going through the dictionary. It's not like there are a few, you know, for comparable forms from Zhangzhou, Chenzhou. There are thousands and thousands. So to be able to digitize this and use this in a, in a more convenient way would be invaluable for the study of Southern Maine in particular, but also Maine more generally. I can show you what I've done to this point. I thought I could finish it by now, but I couldn't. Uh, someone had better not have done this before, <laughs> or uh, I would feel like it was a lot of wasted effort, but it's an utter nightmare to digitize. I'll show you just sort of the entries. So, you know, if we go down into the entries, um, this is in some random order that it was in when I was manipulating it in one way or other, largely alphabetical, but we can see there are tens of thousands of individual entries. So this is sort of, you. the file is not done, but you're gonna sense for the vision of what this thing should be. Um, these happen to be, so there are, the formatting of the book is rather complicated. Uh, and um, sometimes there are, there, there are various um, indications of, for example, uh, the corresponding so-called literary pronunciation of a particular word, or uh, oftentimes, the, the, the same atom on in neighboring varieties, uh, most, uh, most often Chenzhou, Zhangzhou, but also several others. Um, but these entries that are here are the ones that are sort of straightforwardly formatted and allow me to just simply uh, bring it over uh, without having to mess too much with uh, the order of the information, and maybe we get the idea. But um, using OCR in this text was a true nightmare. I mean, you can do a lot now with even with uh, with Adobe Acrobat and things like that. You can do a lot of very impressive uh, optical character recognition, even on Chinese. On Chinese, if the file is clear, it works remarkably well. It does not work well, needless to say, for diacritical marks. So uh, training systems to do this in a way that was more or less reliable took a long time. And you can see there are still typographical errors, however, largely systematic errors, such that once I get this in a more organized form, I can uh, take care of a particular kind of error at one stroke. Um, so anyway, my, my feeling is when this is done, it will be a terrifically useful resource. And I don't think it's that far away. Probably 95% of it is in a form that's sort of usable now. Um, other pieces of it require more work, you know, you have to, so these are complicated lines where you have, uh, 
different kinds of information presented together and I want to organize it. So the goal is, for example, you can see that the goal is to align corresponding pieces of data. So uh, the R means literary pronunciation. That information actually is not necessarily very useful if you're just studying comparative mean. However, it's there in the book and it's useful potentially for other sorts of research ends. So there seems no reason not to preserve it in a digital version. So the idea is to preserve R and align them and then gradually to preserve and align all the other uh, dialect points. So for example, have Trenjo all aligned, which will be many thousands of Trenjo forms according to this particular dictionary and so on. So um, yeah, we'll see how long this takes to get done, but at least you get a sense for where it's heading, which is a digital version that reflects this Dictionary of 1873 fairly faithfully. Um, yeah, it's another situation where you you could um, you could um, you know simplify it in various ways in order to create a you know, sort of uh, simpler, more coherent digital file. But my thought for now is to preserve as much of this information as I can, keep it in the same order. And of course, number each individual entry so that, so that you can flip it around and then flip it back to its original order. That's the idea for Douglas's dictionary. Let's see. Um, yeah, so I can just show you these last few things very quickly. This dictionary of Santo, I mean, there are many early uh, sort of dictionaries, resources, lexicons of mean languages. This one is nice because it's very colloquial. The author says as much where um, he's focused on the spoken language. And someone started doing this in a wiki book. It's not done thoroughly. So it's possible I can use that and complete it. But at any rate, uh, this is also a southern mean language, uh, uh, an early 19th century reflection uh, that ought to be digitized. I've started it, but haven't gotten very far. Probably there's not uh, much point in looking at a digital version, but at some point that would be something that would be nice to have done. Um, I'm missing something crucial. So for example, if we go to sort of holer Oh, this wasn't what I was thinking of opening. I'll show you that shortly. So published in Taiwan relatively recently, we have sort of early 19th century missionary uh, articles where they were publishing newspapers uh, in various forms, uh, disseminating them, originally written in Beiwezi, written in Momonized script. So stuff like that. Um, this is a book that I photocopied and OCR. However, of course, as we just mentioned, o o the OCR is useful in that you can ident you can search in for individual words. You can find stuff in this text that you couldn't find in the hard copy. You can find individual words that you're looking for, um, but not with 100% reliability. And also diacritics are not gonna work. So again, it's a question of how to move forward with this text. Uh, this series is like four books that are full of a uh, hundred year old articles written in Romanized script, some by European missionary authors, many by local Chinese Christians. Some have Christian themes, but some are sort of just more general social cultural themes. So it's tremendously interesting to read through. Um, but it's not very easy to uh, make it super, super accessible, searchable. Um, now it's sort of, again, this is a copyrighted book, so it's not the same as the earlier dictionaries where you just want to share it around. But uh, ultimately, it would be nice to have access to resources like this uh, in digital form. But digitizing this, maybe you guys know better than I do.
uh, is there some magical way to create digital forms of text like this? As far as I know, state of the art does not allow you to do it very well. Um, but definitely something for the future is digital versions of texts like this. Um, yeah, same for same for text like this. So this is all Romanized Taiwanese textbooks from late seventies, early eighties. Uh, it's almost not. A, it's almost. It's almost just a collection of language. I mean, it's so massive. There are tens of thousands of sentences, tens of just hundreds and hundreds of paragraphs and stories. And when we start looking through it, we find that the languages has changed over in the only in the course of fifty years or so. Um, I was going to look at some specific examples. It's, it's really. It's not very important. Um, but what tends to happen to actually this is sort of not only uh, you know Taiwanese affected by contemporary Mandarin it's any uh, regional language impacted by a regional standard or a national standard so it's the kind of process that goes on or has been going on sort of throughout uh, China since forever um, so especially if you're studying mean, then you have to always be thinking about these issues. Um, there seems to be the possibility for impact influence at any level um, where individual words get replaced. Um, uh, Disyllabic words sort of get, uh, get glossed uh, from standard languages in a way that's a bit weird from the point of view of just borrowing, right? We're thinking about, so yeah, if you listen to older Taiwanese speakers, of course, they'll simply code switch a Mandarin word. But over time, it seems instead of uh, uh, having a, a sound borrowing or phonetic borrowing, as we might expect it, instead you have sort of glossing of individual syllables into local language. So you create core, sort of local calc of uh, standard words and gradually local calcs uh, tend to displace earlier native vocabulary. The thing about a mean is that these processes have of course been going on for a long time, but relative to other southern, other regional Chinese languages, these processes have had less impact. So more of earlier colloquial material survives. Um, so in the case of, for example, Taiwanese, you can watch this in progress, you know, from from year to year. So from the 80s to now, this kind of thing has happened. So, well, yeah, I had to show you one example. This is under uh, this word. Um, well, you can see my cursor. That doesn't matter. Um, if we look at, I'll show you, I'll show you um, a modern dictionary. We look at this for just a second. So this little grammatical particle that introduces a patient uh, means uh, for the benefit of the thing, towards the thing, uh, this kind of thing. This seems to be part of Taiwanese and Southern mean more generally, not related in an obvious, okay, maybe, we can make arguments about some Mandarin cognate word, but seems to just be a piece of Taiwanese grammar or a Hokkien grammar. However, now we can find sentences like this in modern Taiwanese that have become very common. It says, you know, pick up the room, clean up the room. And the room is introduced with this particle where the idea is do it to the room. But this kind of sentence is modeled on Mandarin syntax, where it's like a ba sentence. So actually, this Mandarin translation uses ba fang dian zhe me zhe Now the Taiwanese sentence says ga. Uh, I probably didn't share my sum, but the idea is you can see that it's closely parallel. Take the room, act on the room, clean it up. Same thing in Mandarin. Ba fang dian, verb. Take the room and clean it up. This kind of sentence does not exist in the early materials. So if you go to Douglas's dictionary, 
he'll say he will only have sort of pronoun person objects with this thing where we're doing to a person or affecting a person in some way and even this this is only from 50 years ago you will not find sentences like that in this book and there are thousands of thousands of them at any rate i just was you know searching through thinking about this particular word this is typical with a, a person um he he's always twisting my ear so gawa to me towards me twists ear this is a typical uh sort of classic taiwanese sentence where he affects me does to me uh and this is uh the kind of sentence that begins to shade towards the modern situation where um the the light bulb is broken and i i'm going to i want to twist it off so i i'm going to guy i'm going to take it and twist it off or am i going to do it for someone or something this sort of ambiguous use of for it to it where we can't be totally confident that this means the action is directed at e the light bulb at any rate this is just one little illustration if you go through douglas's dictionary sentences from 1873 marrying all sentences from 50 years ago and then uh, the sentences that are presented inside our modern dictionary you'll find this process of sort of uh uh mannerization syntax mannerization of syntax over time in many respects um so useful interesting in its own right and also sort of an illustration of the degree to which and the ways in which standard language is impacting uh these mean varieties i feel like i've taken up enough of your time um and i went through most of the material that i have i didn't look at them in as much detail as i was thinking i could but it's all good we spent more than an hour let me see um I'll close this stuff up. Yeah, let's close okay. all this. Um, I mean, I can just I, I I can make like one minute of sort of concluding remarks or general thoughts. Uh, one is, um, can we build a bigger list of core mean lexical items that's a that's a, that's bigger than what Norman etc. were working with 50 years ago using material like this? Maybe there are possibilities to expand uh, this set of important words uh, to some degree, maybe even to considerable degree. Um, and then can we study some really really specific changes? I'll show you one word like. Uh, I was thinking of discussing this word in more detail, but well, let's not. Let's just look it up in this dictionary. Like nose, it's not supposed to be nasalized. Uh, if you look at, for example, uh, we don't we don't need to look it up in another book, but uh, it seems to be mixed in southern mean. In other mean languages, nose does not have a nasal vowel. But in southern mean languages, for some reason, there is a nasal vowel. And why? We can read in, for example, Go Beach's book talks about this phenomenon a little bit, but largely uh, talking about um, in literary layers, where for whatever reason, uh, a non nasal vowel has been borrowed into mean languages with a nasal vowel. But this stuff is not borrowed. This is deeply mean in fact this bar this belongs to the important group of so-called voiced aspirated words where you know, on a system like norman's this will have a voiced aspirated onset in common mean or proto mean but why nasalized vowel anyway one idea is that it's a very very narrow condition change that happened in particular places in southern mean uh, what 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 are the conditions is not clear but this looks a lot like the word ear and some other words ear is written as he in some sources written as he he with a nasalized vowel and other sources same for this word nose written as p sometimes p sometimes 
So you suspect that this relates to um, voicing neutralization, relates to vowel quality, relates possibly to uh, the onset the onset category. So any of these things are possible. Um, so looking at more data and more detail might allow us to answer this kind of question. This one is just one random question, but is important for the nature of this particular item knows in common mean, in proto mean. Uh, it could tell us something about the onset, which is sort of exactly the question Norman had about this category. Is it voiced aspirates or is it something else in voiced aspirates or just a placeholder? At any rate, this is the sort of uh, level of granularity that we might have to get to in order to, to understand some of these issues more closely. Um, Yeah, um, maybe I'll maybe I'll maybe I'll wrap it up. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Hopefully, I covered um, these sources in a way that everyone could understand. Maybe you'll have better ideas about how to utilize some of these resources.